Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody today. <laughs> I heard one really enthusiastic good morning. Everyone else is kind of still waking up, I think. Welcome to First Baptist Church this morning. We're going to kick off with a song. Stand and sing along, if you would, and uh, let's worship today. What a beautiful weekend, what beautiful weather, a holiday weekend, it's exciting. We've got one of the most exciting sermon series that we've had in a long time right now. School's back in. Did Ironton win again this weekend? Yeah, Ironton won again. It's all good, right? We're glad that you're here. Visitors, again, welcome. So glad you're here. You only have to be here twice. You're not a visitor anymore, okay? So we're really glad you're here. And I'm going to ask you, while we're doing announcements, would you, if you don't have your Bible, just reach the one in front of you. Look at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. We're going to point out something in there. As far as announcements go, wow, have we got a busy month. In September if you look at the back of your program this morning on the back on the 16th well okay on the 11th we've got our Red Cross blood mobile coming in 
and we're really good about that, but you need to, uh, you need to reserve a time, make sure you got a time in there. So get a hold of Tierra there and make sure that you don't miss anything with that. On the 16th, we got something we haven't done for a long time here. It's date night. It's date night. And we're going to have a really capable, energetic crew ready to receive children down here. Eric has got a plan all mapped out. I won't, I won't spoil that for you, but it's going to be a fun date night. And you might have to actually go borrow some kids maybe in order to be a part of it. But whatever you do, if, if kids show up here, we're going to take care of them. And it's going to be a fun night. So Eric will give you more on that later on. We've also got a really fun night coming up on the 19th. What we're going to do is a group of us, we're already together, we already got tickets, we can buy more tickets. We're going to head over to Ashland, grab something to eat, and go to a really interesting movie that we get excited about that talks about modern-day Israel and the historical sites on the famous Route 60. That's a north-south route that goes all the way up and down. And it actually goes through places that when we take our trips over there, we don't go to some of these places. a little too dangerous. So it's going to be really neat. We want to encourage you. Come join us. So look at the details there. We, we'll buy more tickets. We'd like to, who knows, last time we did one of these, we were the only ones in the uh, movie theater. We had our own place. So maybe it'll turn out similar to that this time. All right, come and join us. And then... We got a trip, an overnight trip this time, and this is the 22nd and 23rd. We're going to go up to the Creation Museum, spend the day at the Creation Museum, and then hang out late at night. It's, it's called the end of summer night, and they've got their big telescope out, and they're experts on the cosmos, and we're going to look at the stars through their special telescope and just have a really neat time talking about what the truth is of what's going on in the cosmos, God's cosmos, and how big and grandeur God is, and just be around exciting Christians and have a really good time. So if you're interested, check with Rebecca or I, and we'll be happy to, uh, to give you more details about that. It'll be another fun night. All right, we got our street fair coming up next month. That's on there, too. As far as announcements go, uh, the Cooper family has a, an announcement. Yesterday at about 4.51 in the afternoon, Noel Cooper come to join us. This church keeps growing, Eric, just keeps getting bigger. And we are excited. And needless to say, uh, Rebecca and I, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been a busy weekend at our house <laughs> this weekend as well, just, just having a really good time. And speaking of a really good time, while you're standing, what kind of package are you carrying in there, young lady? Tell us about this. <laughs> we, the, the, the NIF family actually has, do we have, do we have a pic? No, okay. All right, next week we'll have a picture. Yeah. And who knows, we might have two pictures of two pretty little girls for you next week. But we are so happy. We've been praying for you guys. And yes, there can be a girl in this family, and we're thrilled about that. All right, before we go to prayer requests, any other announcements, anything going on? Yes, ma'am. Oh my. Don't miss it. Yeah, it's always a good time. Amen. Thank you. Any other announcements before we go to prayer requests? All right. Well, we do have some updates on prayer requests. We're really glad to say that Janet had her surgery uh, last week. And everything went as well as what we could have hoped for. And um, she's recovering now. Uh, we'll see her back in town here in just a couple of days, it looks like. And we're thankful. We're going to say that as an answered prayer right there with Janet. Um, with Susan Melinda, uh, we just want to keep praying there. Still some things, just not, don't know what it is, but just uh, that infection's just not going away as fast as what everybody would hope for. So let's keep praying for Susan. With Phyllis Greenwood, we're so glad that she got that tube out of her chest and 
a little bit of infection going on there, still working with that. Does anybody have any further update on Phyllis? We're just praying that the medication continues to work, that she doesn't need any other surgery. She gets her strength up, and then that gets her a chance to get in that pain clinic and get her comfort back. She still really needs our prayers, all right? And we've had, Ramona's had a rough week. She did get her PET scan back. And without going into the details, they did some, find some things that's uh, real concerning. They're, they weren't real happy with the results of the PET scan. Ramona's asking that the church pray. Please pray. Um, they're considering options now for what do they do next. Uh, we're still hoping that we can get that pain management under control and, and get that to a better condition. So Ramona really needs our prayers. Ron Kettle was supposed to have his stress test Friday. The machine broke, and he's still hanging in limbo there. So they're trying to get something rescheduled for him. Um, certainly it's something that is concerning with the family. They're just trying to get some answers, and uh, let's be praying. Uh, for Ron, Laura, the family, um, let's be praying that we get some answers on there real soon. Melanie Long will be starting uh, her treatments this week. Um, wish she was here to stand up real quick and say, and God's still in control. That's what she would say if she, oh, my goodness, yeah, I got a wave back there. That's good. Um, so we're thankful. We're thankful for victory in the heart because that's the only thing that really matters. Amen. Other prayer requests. Or more updates. Yes, ma'am. Home and thankful and just completely healed up. Just going to catch up on, on that growth curve and everything, and everything's going to be really good. So thankful. The man family is so happy. Other prayer requests. Hmm. Okay, that's Tyler Shelton. She's asking for prayer from the church because of fever. So concerned about that. Yes, the man family. Okay. All right, so Yvonne Wilson recovering from a stroke over at King's Daughters. Let's remember that one. Others? Anybody else? All right, before we do that, I want you to look in Luke chapter 11 with me real quick. In Luke chapter 11, I'm not sure that everything in this chapter is in chronological order, but Luke would get something and he would stack these, these events in an order to try to bring out something to us. God's talking, or Jesus is talking about, this is how you pray, it's the Lord's prayer, and, and he he gets a response back from the people. They said, well, we don't think you're from God. We actually think you're involved in Beelzebul and you're using satanic powers to, to run these demons out. And that really was, that was it. That was the breaking point when Jesus said, now my focus is going to be on the Gentile church. Now my focus is going to be on them because you've had enough miracles. And he says, now, let me, let me help you out. You guys are so worried about the outside. It's about the inside. If you'll listen to my word, if you will hear my word, and if you will then meditate upon my word, if you will apply my word, if the word gets inside your heart, you will become the light. You will become the evidence. You will become what the Holy Spirit uses to change the city of Ironton. Literally, that's what he promised us. Now let us look in verse 33. Luke 11, verse 33. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on its stand so that those who come in, the city of Ironton, for those who come in may see the light, the light of Jesus Christ. Your eye, then he, now he said, that's what it looks like on the outside. Now, what goes on on your inside? When your eyes are good, when they're working right, your whole body is also full of light. You walk around understanding and doing things better. But when they are bad, when you can't see, your body is also is full of darkness. 
talking metaphorically about the heart, your heart is full of darkness. Now, see to it. <laughs> Jesus commands this because he's frustrated. See to it, then, that the light within you is not darkness. Eric's going to drill down on that this morning. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light, if, if the Word of God gets in through your spiritual eyes, and then inside of you no part of it is dark anymore, it will be completely lighted on the inside as when the light of the lamp shines on you. Let us, right now, before we pray, and as we pray, let us get our spiritual eyes wide open, tune out everything else, let God's Word penetrate us in a way we become filled with His good news gospel in a way that it begins to come out everywhere we go. It'll change your family. It'll change your children. It'll change your grandchildren. It'll change your school. It'll change your city block. Let us pray. Father, we know that you are capable of everything you promise. And that Luke has exposed a mystery that, that before this we didn't understand that when we truly hear and apply your word, you will change us on the inside and our neighbors and our children will see and they will know that we've been with you. So Father, we now pray that this applies to every one of us this morning. And now Lord, we just pause in that and we say thank you. Thank you for, for Jesse that's here with a newborn and with Sarah that has a newborn. And we can't wait to see what these little girls will be like when we help them be filled with the light of your word. We're so thankful, Father, that you are moving in our midst. We're so thankful, Father, that, that Melanie has got victory and joy even though she's going further into this storm of treatments. But we pray, we pray, Lord, keep her strong. We pray for Phyllis, Father, as she continues to take these antibiotics. Keep her strong. Ramona, in the middle of a new storm and a new phase, and as difficult as it is, Father, she is a rock of faithfulness. Keep her strong for the benefit of her family, those that she has an influence on. With Ron, Father, as he has to be patient, Lord, in waiting for these treatments, Father, let him be found faithful. Father, with Susan, Lord, yes, she loves you and she trusts you and she tells everybody who will listen about the light that's inside of her. Thank you, Father, for the light that's in Susan and that she continues to remind people about it. We just pray, Father, for her as she's going through this difficult, difficult time. And there's others that's been asking us to pray for Yvonne Wilson, Father, in this stroke over at King's Daughters. We pray, Lord, that, that that recovery will go well, that she will continue to heal, Father, for this prayer request. Um, for uh, Tyler Shelton, Father, that she will be relieved of this fever, this difficulty that has been um, plaguing her right now, Father, that she might even today, Lord, if it be your will, that you might get glory from letting that fever break. We will give you all the praise and glory. For the fact of Steve Cook that we've been praying for for this last week, Father, and, and he is now able to be out of the hospital, but my miraculous survival story. We thank you, Father. We thank you. You, you have your hand upon your people, and you have a plan, and we want to be found in the middle of that plan that you can continue to do miracles in our lives. For our church and every event that is ongoing and what's planned coming up, Father, please, we pray that you get glory. Now, Father, even from the songs of worship, get glory from the fruits of our lips, Father. Let the noises that comes out of our mouth give you praise and glory. And then lastly... We ask a blessing upon Pastor Eric as he brings forth the truth from your word, Father. Would it be your words? Would it be your power? Would it be, Father, your spirit that stirs from his voice and stirs with our spirit and don't let us ever be the same? Let this be the morning, Father, that we see you more clearly. We trust you. Our hope is in you. Where else would we go? We love you, Lord. Now we ask you to bless this service. In the name of Jesus, God's people said, Amen. Let's stand with us, please.
Let us pray. Father, thank you uh, for this morning and this day that you've given us to come together in your name and praise your name. Thank you for all that you have provided for us, Lord, and that is everything. Spiritually, physically, you are the provider. And we just give a little bit of that back to you now, Lord, and we just ask your blessing upon it, your direction that we use it in accordance to your will and how you want us to use it for your name, to spread your name across this world and this community, the world that so badly needs to hear the name of Jesus and about your light and your love. We love you, we thank you, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. Don't you? 
All right, youth children, head on out. Big children, let's turn to Psalm 36. And uh, Jimmy, you guys up on the thing there, I'm going to be reading out of NIV here this morning, okay? Psalm 36. Um, that's the blue Bible in front of you, NIV. Yes, Linda. Amen. Awesome. Amen. And that last song to me is, man, God gives us the heart we have in us, and all he wants is our heart back. And if we got nothing else to offer, just give him everything you got from your heart out, and, and it'll be just fine, because that's all he wants. He, if that's, man, like when I sing that last song, and come on, don't get shy, and lift up that, you know, like you got a lion inside of those lungs. Man, there's something about me that it's... I, I get that picture of Tim Tebow on a football field when he's just ah, all in, like, let's go. It's like, let's go, God. we we got to get in the game. we got to get in the fight. we got to make sure people know the truth. we we got to get all in for God. And so hopefully that's what it, it makes you feel as well. And that's what we want to just share in the Word. And uh, last week, we started talking about the light. We're going to be reading some passages over the next couple weeks about the light and the darkness. And all of these deal with light and darkness in the world. And uh, as I said last week, there is a metaphor that runs from Genesis all the way through Revelation about the light and the darkness. And uh, a lot of times, those are either about us, they're about Jesus, it's about God, it's about the world we live in. It, it encompasses all these areas. And uh, last week, we looked at 1 John 1, 5 through 10. And we really kind of picked apart that verse and looked at it from a way that we could see that when you bring your life to God and you have the Holy Spirit living in you, He partners that Spirit with His Word. So we, we come to Him through the living Word, Jesus. But then we have the living written Word now, applied to our heart and it provides this enlightenment this illumination so that we can understand and have knowledge about him we can understand and have knowledge about our sin in our life and we looked about how he reveals our purpose and our plan his his purpose and plan but how he reveals that to us so that we now can partner with him and know what we're supposed to be doing in this light. And that's how we, lock, we talked about light and darkness last week. And people who, who stay apart from Christ, they never fully know God. They'll never know God. 
They'll never know their purpose or plan for living. They'll never really be what God created them to be while they were in their mother's womb because they've never partnered or brought their life out of the darkness into the light. So that's what, what last week was all about. This week, we're going to be uh, reading from some verses as well. And uh, the main key verse starting off is from Psalm 36. And we're going to be uh, looking at Psalm 36. And in Psalm 36, it's kind of this doxology that, that David is writing towards God. And he's really just allowing us to know some things about God. And he's, he's revealing part of the, the character of God and just praising God through this. But as he's doing this, he's using the metaphor of light to describe the glory of God to us and why it's needed. And so we're just going to start there in uh, verse 5. We'll start in verse 5 there. Um, Psalm 36, verse 5. And uh, we'll start here. Your love, which we've, we've sung this song before. This is a praise song we sing. Okay? Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. And your justice is like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from your river of delight. And then right here, for you, with you, is the fountain of life. So we've got life there, but it's partnered right next to in your light we see light. And there's kind of something about that statement that goes, okay, what's that actually mean then? In your light, we see light. What's that mean? But, but also, we need to always see that in Scripture, light and life, life and light are always connected, okay? And we're going to look through that, but, but I love this because God is just being exalted in this process. David is just exalting all these areas of him and, and his wonders. Um, we get protection from his wings. We get abundant feast from his house. We get rivers of refreshing from him because he delights in doing that. And we have a fountain that literally brings life to us. But then he says, it's your light that in your light we do see light. And so we want to just kind of look at this for just a second and we want to see what this would mean for us. Okay? The first thing we need to talk about is just light in general. All right? So A, natural light is used as a metaphor to grasp the truth of spiritual or divine light. You can write spiritual or divine light in there in your life. And so throughout the Bible when we see this, we know that, that when he talks about the light... He's describing something that all of us kind of understand. Well, we know what the light is. We under, we, all of us understand what light is. However, he's using that to describe something much deeper spiritually to us. And light, though, if we really want to get serious about it, and we kind of got really serious about it in our study on Wednesday night. We really looked at, at some things on Wednesday night. And the key is this. Light is pretty, it's super complex. And it's, it's very hard to really define in a sentence. You know, have you ever had anybody come up to you and say, hey, define light for me. That's not the easiest thing in the world to do. You know, and, and in this life, you'll look and a natural light, if you're taking notes there, number two, natural light is the electromagnetic radiance. I didn't make you fill those in. I didn't want you to have to try to spell those words. I wouldn't want to either. So it is the electromagnetic radiance of the sun that is either absorbed, refracted, or reflected so that it can be seen or used in this world. You know, and we talked about some things this week on Wednesday night that was kind of crazy that, you know, the collars we see are when that white light hits 
something solid and part of it gets absorbed but the other part reflects off of that and what you see in reflection is the collar and so the collars you see around you it's it's light bouncing off of something and part of it being absorbed and the rest you're seeing and that's the the collar it is and that's it's kind of crazy when you think of it and, and I'm one of those that I could never fully understand this I told him Wednesday night I still I've been in science classes through all my ages in school. I can regurgitate information from the professor. I can read stuff and just say it back to you, but I have no understanding of things like radio airwaves and how we capture those and, and I can listen to them in my house. I have no understanding of how a TV really works and I can actually see the picture on my tube in the house, which I know we don't have picture tubes anymore but but I can't you know what I mean I, I have no understanding of how they they grab those things out of the air and somehow make them available to you in your house I, I, I will never understand it. I'm not wired that way that's not how God made me but I understand when I read it what the terminology is and the same is true when it comes to spiritual light okay so so we all just kind of have to agree man light is something that we can kind of define but in reality it goes way deeper and it's more complex than any of us and there are studies still being done at some of the greatest technical colleges in the United States by some of the smartest professors on planet earth and the students in those rooms are some of the smartest kids you know when it comes to techno stuff tech and they all agree we're never going to get to the bottom of this. And that's the very first thing that God said, let there be. <laughs> and we still, can't under, we still can't scratch the surface of what it really, really means. And that's just something we have to, to understand. And the same is true spiritually. When somebody comes up to you and says, tell me how, how divine glory works in your life, how spiritual light works in your life. You know, define it for me. We kind of have a hard time coming up with a, a thing. I, I looked this week and just kind of tried to answer that question by punching in to the Google machine and, and asking that. And it said, spiritual light is God's glory, the radiance of the infinite beauty and greatness of God's manifold perfection. That's, that's a good definition. But now, tell me what you understand, really, about that. And really what it is, is it's saying that God's glory, the reflection, the radiance of God's glory, is what provides the world with spiritual light and life, is really what that means. And when you read the Bible, we can pick up on those things. And when we go to, to John chapter 1 and we start reading about Jesus being the light and the life and he came into the world that was dark and he brought the light of life into the world and, he, and it talks about those things we can understand what it's saying when you turn to Revelation and you get to the end of Revelation there and in Revelation 30 or 21 23 and it talks about how there's not going to be any darkness in heaven how there's no need for a sun or a moon because the glory of God gives it the light. That's, that's what spiritual light is. That's what divine light is. It's the radiance of God's presence just being there. It illuminates all things. And as we said last week, it's Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 when he says, let there be, and there was. God was introducing his presence into a dark world and light happened because he was there he revealed his glory to the emptiness and that became light before there ever was a sun in the sky okay so the key that we understand is this hey yeah light is super hard it's uh it's hard to explain hard to define it's way more complex than we can fully understand and we can say that about natural light or spiritual light however what we can agree on is this a number four even if we have a hard time defining light we do understand its basic functions 
how important what it does is. And what does light do? And that's what we really want to look at here for just a minute is what light does. And so we're moving on to B. Light is essential for two things, illumination and life. If that's all we understand about light, we're, we're getting somewhere, okay? We need illumination and we need life. And you cannot have those without light, okay? So in the natural sense, we cannot have those. Light and life are always woven together, as I said earlier. And so natural reality, think about it. We depend on light. We depend on the sun's light for illumination. We need light to show us where we are and where we're going. Okay? It's hard to find your way around if you can't see. It's just plain and simple. We need light to be able to see where we're going. Sometimes when we talk about light, what we mean is I need to know the reality of, of what's around me. You know, if I'm in a room and I don't know what else is in that room, if I'm out in the woods camping and I wake up at 4 in the morning and it is pitch black out there in the middle of the woods and I hear some sounds in the woods, I need to know what's around me. What is out there? And the only way for me to do that is to turn on a flashlight, turn, give me some light so that I can see what I'm dealing with here. And the same is true in this life. We need to know our surroundings, and we only can know our surroundings by light. Man, we, we think about things, and you know, you can make a compass, and by the electromagneticism of the, the, the sun, you can, you can make a, a homemade makeshift compass with static electricity, and it will point you in the right direction. We can find direction as long as there's some sort of light being provided there. We can actually make almost like a sundial, you know, and as long as the sun is shining and it creates a shadow, I can tell you what time of the day it is because of the, the sun shining on that. So it lets me know where I am, what direction I'm going, you know, what time of day it is. It, it lets me know my surroundings. However, it also brings life. Without sun, there would be zero life. We find this out as kids when we're in elementary class, and remember they give us that little milk cup, milk carton, and you put some dirt in it, and you plant a seed in that, and you put it in the window sill of the classroom, and every day you put a little water in there and the sunlight that comes through, and you see that little, little plant in the window over the next couple days. Anybody else do that? Was that just me? You know, Linda, didn't you have us do that in class, I think? You know, it's to prove there's a process that, that brings life. And then the reality is this. If that wasn't true, we can't eat and we can't live. We survive by eating plants that eat light or by eating meat that eats plants, that eats life, light. You know what I'm saying? It's the way things are. Light is providing life for us, whether we know it or not. When it comes down to it, our bodies need certain vitamins that the sun, the light provides in our life. Our bodies help function off of this. We're not able to survive without the healing effect of that electromagnetic radiance that the sun produces. And so it provides life, it provides illumination. Well, the same is true, let's just flip this, the same is true when it comes to spiritual light. But it does this on a spiritual level. So the same way our bodies physically need light to exist and to be able to function right, is the same way our spiritual life needs the light, the radiance of God, the presence of God, the glory of God in it, or we're, we're not going to be living life 
the way we're supposed to. We're not even going to be alive, actually. We may think we are, and we'll get to that in a second, but we may not even really be alive. And so that same divine light, it shows us the way to go. So that divine spiritual light that David is referring to here in in Psalm 36, when he's describing God, is the same that in 1 John 1, 5 that we read last week, that he is the light is God. He is light. I mean, that's who he is. And when we look in Revelation 21 there, Like we said, and it describes that there's never going to need any sun or light in heaven because His presence is going to be that. The light of God gives that light to it. That's what David is alluding to and and revealing for us when he's talking about that light. And he's, he's naming all these great attributes of God. And then he says, we need the light to see the light. And he's describing that for us because that divine light shows us, one, it shows us the way to go. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. Divine light reveals what is true about our spiritual surroundings. I don't even know I'm a sinner if I don't have the light illuminated in my heart. If I don't have the reality of Jesus If I've never seen my life as compared to God, I'll never know how bad I really am and how glorious He really is. Until I see the glory of the light, I never know that I'm standing in darkness or evil. We see this. Matthew 4.16, it says, The people that were dwelling in darkness have seen a great light And for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death, because that's where we were, we were in the shadow of death, in the region of death. That was the surrounding we were in. On them a light has dawned. And that's the description of Jesus. On them a light has dawned, and now they recognize they were in darkness or they were in death. And that divine light literally gives and brings spiritual life to us. All through Scripture, we see this. And in 2 Corinthians, it talks about us being blinded to the truth. But then it says, let light shine out of the darkness. God said, let light shine out of the darkness. And it has shown into our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory, the radiance of God now can be in you. And we saw it in the face of Jesus Christ, it says, in the person of Jesus. So we come to that understanding through the person of Jesus, but we receive then the radiance of God in our life, and then we no longer are dead in the darkness, is what that's saying. But here's the the problem, okay? We can can say all that, and and the natural light then, number two under, under B, the natural and spiritual sense then shows us the way to go, lets us recognize our surroundings, and brings and sustains life to us. That's what we need the light for. But here's the real problem, C, okay? C. And the key problem is this. Some people's light is darkness. And you go, whoa, what's that sentence even mean? Some people's light, it is darkness. Well, I didn't say it. Jesus did. David read it earlier from Luke. I'm going to read it from another passage here in just a second. But this is what David is also talking about. Now, see, David, nowhere in Psalm 36 does he talk and use the word darkness. However, when you read the first four verses, we're in darkness. And he describes what being in the darkness is like before he started describing the radiance of God in there. And so if we go back to verse 1 through 4 in Psalm 36, it says, Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. 
There is no fear of God before their eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity or sin cannot be found out or hated. That's by himself. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit, and he has ceased to act wisely or do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is no good. He does not reject evil. That's what people who live in the darkness are like. While they're on their bed, they're thinking of bad things to carry out. But when they're thinking of bad things, they don't think they're bad things. They don't hate (laughs) those acts or those things in their life. Their transgressions are deep within their heart, but they don't even fear God about those things because they don't even see them as wrong. That's what David is getting at here. Is There are some people who are lost in darkness, but the great thing is there is a God who reveals and has a fountain of life for them. He wants to feed them at his own table. He wants to provide all these good things for them. But it's only by his light that they'll ever see the light, is what he's saying. Because in the reality, when David is talking here, he's letting them know that he's talking about people who are spiritually blind. The same type of people that Paul talks about. But he talked about them before Paul spoke about them in the New Testament there. And Paul said they are darkened in their foolish heart in Romans 1.21. Paul said they are they're wicked. He's, he calls them the wicked whose minds the God of this world, with a little g, that's the devil, the God of this world has blinded to keep them from seeing God's light. So they, they don't know any better. In 2 Corinthians 4, 3, he says that. But then Jesus even said this before Paul said it. And Jesus said it the same way we read from Luke 11 earlier. We want to read from Matthew 6, 22 and 23. And he says, the eye is the lamp to your body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of life. And now he's talking about focus. He's talking about what you focus on. Are you focused on the light? Is your perspective in life coming from God, the light? Have you been understanding of the light? Or are you still on your natural eyesight perceiving all things? And he's saying this. Listen, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. And he's talking metaphorically here. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And then he says, if then the light in you is darkness, how great is your darkness? Listen, what he's saying is this. If what you perceive to be true is actually a lie. If what you think is right is actually wrong, if you think that you're living life rightly or perfectly or on the right track, but actually you're going completely down the wrong road, how bad off are you? Because you've bought into a lie. You've misunderstood what life is all about. You think one way, but the reality is something completely different. You're seeing life in a whole wrong scope. And until the light goes off in your head, (laughs) until the light happens, you'll never be able to actually see the light. All you're actually really letting in is more darkness. And you don't even know it. That's what he's talking about. And you know what, guys? I'm going to be honest. There are people in pews every single week that believe they're going to heaven just because they sit in a church pew. That's a lie. 
and they've bought into a lie, and they're not seeing the light. They're not seeing the truth. There are people every single week in church pews that think good people make it to heaven, and that's a lie. And they're living really good lives and trying really hard to please God with their life. There are religions in the world that people live really morally good lives. They are literally trying to tell others about their God. They're trying to bring others to Him, but they are still lost because they bought a lie. And that's what he's saying is, man, if, if you're one of those people in the world that have, have still never received the light, Jesus, and you have these eyes that see the world in all these different ways, but in reality, all those different ways aren't right. They're wrong. And actually, instead of being enlightened or lit up towards truth, you're actually going and you're buying into a lie that is going to lead you further away from God and straight into death and hell. That's a scary thing. Because he says, then, how bad is that darkness? There's no other worse place to be in life than to think you're on the right path, but in reality be in the wrong place. Because at that point, it's hard for me to listen to anybody else telling me anything different because I've bought into believing everything I believe is right. And what Jesus was getting at is, man, if, if you are... And, and he's talking to Jews... He's talking to people who have the whole Old Testament. They have these words of David, probably memorized in their heart. But they're missing the point of Jesus as Savior right in front of them. And they're not only missing the point as Him being Savior, they're actually calling Him the devil. See, they've totally missed it. And He says, how bad is it going to be then? How bad is your darkness? If you think one thing, but in reality, it's totally different than what you're seeing. You need the light. You need the truth to be revealed to you. And so when we look at that under C, the darkness David described is the same described by Paul. <laughs> Jesus revealed the problem before Paul ever did. And the, the problem is this, the blinded mind can make the lost believe that they are living in the light. Listen, the Bible says that, that the devil masquerades as an angel of light. He makes you believe that what you believe is right, when in reality you're wrong. If you're not believing every single thing based on the person of Jesus, you're wrong. And that's why we have to, to move on to D here, which is important. And we have to understand the light. And this is the truth. A life lived only in the light of Jesus can claim to see the light. Only those who have the light of Jesus in their life, they're the only ones who can see the light. They're the only ones who are getting it right in the end. And this is why the gospel is so good, though, because there's tons of people dwelling in darkness on a daily basis, and they don't even know it. But Jesus, the true light which gives light to every man, came into the world precisely to dispel the darkness. And that's what we're told in John 1.9. And then he even stated it very clearly, that I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, is what he says. Only then will you be experiencing life the way life was meant to be experienced. He even says, hey, the thief, he came to steal, kill, destroy, but I have come that you may have life abundant to the fullest. You may experience Real connection with God and real life in the presence of God, he said in John 10.10. 10. 
We look, and it tells us in John 1, 4, that in him was life. Okay? In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. There is no other. And listen, that's for this world and the world to come. Jesus is the only real light of all worlds. There is no other. And unless your life... Listen, if you think you're going to be with God because you've been trying to be a good person, you are not going to heaven. You need to come into the light of Jesus Christ. If you think, my parents took me to church while I was a kid, so I was in church, I heard stuff, I'll, I'll be in heaven, I think I'll be okay. Because my mom, she was a great person, and she, she loved the Lord, and she prayed, and she prayed for me all the time, so I think I'll be in heaven. No, you won't. You're not in the light. There's a difference. And listen, guys, we have people literally in, in funerals saying these things to people. They're lying to people. The devil, the angel of light, is using Bible verses halfway through people that people are listening to in times of need, and he's sharing lies to them so that they will be blinded to the truth and they won't get the full light. We've got to come all the way into the person of Jesus, if we really want to be able to see. That's what David was getting at. That when I come into the light, I see the light. Listen, Jesus, he is the incarnation of Psalm 36, verse 9. When when David was saying this, this was hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus ever showed up on planet earth as a child to live and reveal the light, the glory of God among man. Yet yet when David was pinning these truths, this poetic sentence, he he was talking about God, but he was talking about Jesus coming into the world. Jesus is the incarnation of this. He is the light by which we finally see the light. Jesus, too, is the light of life. He embodies all that light is and does. So those things we described at the beginning, like why did we go over that stuff about natural light and spiritual light and all that? Did I have to know any of those definitions anyway? No, there's not going to be a test this week. However, the reason we went over those is because we had to agree on the fact that life is only brought through light. We have no chance of living as human beings if there is no light. Physically, but also spiritually. And Jesus is that light. Just the way the sun in the sky provides the ability for those plants to grow in the windowsill and you to have something to eat and animals to have something to eat and you to have those nutrients that you need and vitamins that you need to live your life. He alone has what you need to experience real life. And He alone illuminates. When you get Jesus in your life, for the first time, when you really come to Jesus, there's people who say this all the time. It's like, man, I don't know what happened, but when I was sitting in that pew and I heard the Word and... and, And it's really the Holy Spirit was was allowing you, he was pulling back the veil. (laughs) Pulling the scales off your eyes for a minute. Going, hey, see the reality here. And he's pulling those scales off your eyes enough so that you see the truth. Paul was walking in darkness. Paul was a stud Jew who loved God or thought he did. He was willing to kill for God. He would do whatever it took to praise God. However, he was slandering the name of Jesus and saying Jesus was not the Messiah. Messiah, And everybody who was preaching Jesus, he was willing to wipe them off the face of the earth if that's what it took. To stop 
the cause of Jesus. He was blinded to the truth. And then God showed up to him on the road to Damascus. Jesus met him in the form of blinding light. And then a couple days later, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, what? Revealed truth to him by what? Peeling the scales off of his eyes so that he could finally see the truth about Jesus, that, you know what? He is the only way to life with God. i got to start telling everybody about this. You know what? I am a sinner, and I have been completely wrong, and I need to change things in my life. He only knew that. Later on, he said, hey, I did need the law when I was a Jew, Like growing up as a Jew, I did learn the law. And that was good because it was through that law that that my sins were revealed to me. If there was no law, I wouldn't have known my sins. But I didn't see that until Jesus happened. I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was living right and doing what was right. But then Jesus happened. A light on the road to Damascus changed everything. That's his testimony. And that's the truth of all of us. We need to ask the Lord to use the light of his presence, the glory of his own presence, to reveal the truth about our hearts, our life. While we sit in these pews, we need to ask him, God, please, if if I've been blinded in any way, I mean, this is what you should be praying now. God, if if right now I'm believing anything wrong, please reveal the truth to me. Shine your light into my heart and let me see the truth. I want to live, I want life like you created me for. And I know that only comes from you, so I want to see the reality of my own surroundings. What dangers are there in my surroundings that I'm allowing in my own life? We may be Christians in the room right now, but there's still times where we allow things to get around us that should not be in the room with us. And we kind of allow it for long enough that we become dim to the truth. Our heart becomes hardened against that reality. So we need God to reveal the truth, shine the light into my existence. Let me see the areas of my life that need to go. If I'm lost or if I'm believing that I'm going to heaven and I'm really not, then God, show me today. Reveal the truth to me because I want to be in heaven with you and I want to know for sure how I need to get there. Reveal the truth to me. This is Jesus. This is what he does. Jesus is the light of life, it says. And the life of light. And he said, I am the way. He's the one that shows us the way to go. I am the truth. He's the one that truly shows us where we really are with God. Only when you come to him do you truly know who God really is and who you really are. And I am the life. There's no other way to experience the radiance of God in your existence unless it's through me. There is no other way. He was saying it clearly about himself. So Jesus, three there, personifies. He is the personification of the definition of spiritual life that we talked about earlier. He's the one. It tells us in Hebrews that he is the definition. It says in Hebrews 1.3 that he is the radiance of the glory of God. That's what we, we said earlier was the definition of spiritual light. The radiance of the glory of God. And he is it, it says in Hebrew. It tells us he is the true light of this world and he will be the true light of the world to come there in Revelation 21. It tells us that. And we won't need any lamps or anything because it says the lamb, he's going to be there 
too. And when they refer to the Lamb, that's Jesus. He's the light. The light's already there, is what it says. So Jesus is the true light of all worlds. And so in conclusion, we look, and David, when writing about God as light, was in fact describing Jesus as Savior. And as I said before, this is hundreds of years before that ever could have happened. And somehow, even though he didn't know about Jesus yet, he knew about God the Father. And as he's writing about darkness and people living in darkness, and then what God the Father can bring to those in darkness, he pins that one little poetic sentence. And it's through light that I see light. And he's pointing us all to Jesus. How awesome is that truth? And so I ask you, as we have the band come forward, just to prepare us for the, the table, as the deacons come forward, and we prepare to take the Lord's Supper this morning, I want you, all of us, to examine in our hearts where we are. God, do I need your light to shine into my darkness? Are there areas of my life that need to be shown to me so that I can avoid those areas and walk closer to you in the light. Am I not destined for the end result? I think I was. I need your light to reveal that truth to me. And I want to live every day to the fullest amount of being used to show your radiance to the rest of the world around me. So what needs to change? Show me through the light of Jesus where I really stand and what really needs to be done. And whatever he leads you to do, step into the light and let him have his way in your life. For only in the light will you see the light. Okay? Let's pray. Father God, we do love you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you that the Old Testament and the New Testament all work together to tell the truth of who you are, who we are, our need for you, but also to point us to the only way and truth and life, the person of Jesus. As you sent him into the world, you were literally bringing light into the darkness, revealing truth to a world in need that had bought into lie, bringing life where there was death. God, we know that all of these things are only through the person of Jesus Christ. And I pray that as we prepare our hearts to take communion today to remember the work that Christ did so that we could be with you, that you would just show us the truth in our own lives. For those lost, let today be the day of salvation through Christ. For those walking in darkness, even though they're children of the light, reveal the truth and call them back to light. And for those who need to just know the plan of how your light can be shown through them to reveal that to others. God, we're going to talk about it in a couple weeks, but you can just lay it upon their heart today that this is what you designed them for. I pray that as everybody seeks you out honestly and brings their life, into the light of Jesus, that you would examine all hearts, that you would tell the truth and reveal the truth to all of us, that we may come into your light and we may experience life the way we were meant to. We ask all of this in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior's name. Amen. We're going to ask you to stand where you are, and as I said, the deacons, you can go ahead and come forward. But if there's anybody that needs to come to the altars, anybody that needs to come forward, share with any of the pastors, and you need us to pray with you, come during this time. Everybody also, just uh, 
let the Lord examine your heart and get right with Him as you take from the table. Seated. And that's the key. We just we want to be a people who live in the light as he is in the light, so that those living in darkness can see the light and come to that light. That's the key. Um, today, as you come and uh, take from the table, I hope that's your heart. Um, and this, this is an open communion table. If you are a believer in Christ, a, a saved, baptized believer in Christ, you do not have to be a member at First Baptist Church to take from the table with us. We want you to, to participate today, okay? Um, we're going to ask. Um, Ty, I'll ask you, would you just pray over the uh, bread?
Doug, would you ask the blessing, please?
So Jesus spoke so often in parables and metaphors and saying, if you eat and drink of me and my message, I will change you. I will make you born again. And if we take in his word, take in that light he's given us, that we will be the light unto a lost and dying world. By this cup, Heavenly Father, we agree. We are available. We will be a light. We will be your light to a lost and dying world. Let us drink.